Welcome to Unit 7, Inference for Quantitative Data, what the emphasis on means. This video is going to cover Topic 7.5, Carrying Out a Test for a Population Mean. And in this video, we're going to look at more examples, because truly, the more examples you see of this, the easier it'll be for you to understand all the different parts and pieces. And there are different types of problems. Some problems, you are given the actual data, and you have to find the mean standard deviation. And other problems, will save you a little bit of time and do that for you. So I actually want to take a look at those types of problems, because again, the more you see, the more you're going to be able you know, to be familiar with it. All right, so here is the first extra example we're going to take a look at. A report says that high school students need a mean amount of seven hours of sleep per school night to appropriately be prepared. Now, Maggie wonders if students at her large high school are accurately prepared because she feels they're not getting enough sleep. She collected a random sample of 50 students from her high school and found a mean sleep time of 6.23 hours with a standard deviation of 1.2 hours. Does this provide significant evidence that students at her school are not getting enough sleep at the 1% level? So what we want, or what we're given here is this is a problem where we are given the mean. So we are directly given the mean of our sample is 6.23 hours. We are given the standard deviation of our samples 1.24 hours, and they do ask us to use a level of significance of 1%. So if we are going to prove, we have to show that my sample is one of those really, really significant samples in the bottom 1%. Why am I saying bottom? Because Maggie, Maggie believes that the kids at her school are not getting enough sleep. So that's why I want to show that this is low. This is significantly low. So let's follow the four steps uh, protocol here. So step one is naming it. This is a one sample t-test for the mean amount of sleep that high school students get per night. And the null is going to be the seven hours, right? We read that seven hours is what they need to be appropriately prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that the kids in Maggie's school are appropriately prepared. That's the null. But then the alternative is what Maggie is trying to prove, what Maggie is trying to show that the kids at her school are on average not prepared. That means under seven hours. Um, we're not using X bars here because remember the null and the alternative are all about the true mean for all the kids in her school. She's just going to use her sample to try to prove her claim. All right, so step two is building the sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution is going to show what any possible sample of 50 is going to look like. I mean, if her school has, say, 2,000 kids in it, then there's going to be millions of possible different samples of size 50. Because if I just replace Kelly with Doug, I got a whole new sample. So um, there's lots of different samples out there, and a sampling distribution will show me the possible means of all those different samples of size 50. So I do um, need to shake the center. Now, I am going to assume the null to be true, right? Because that's what you have to do in a test. So I am going to put 7 as the mean of all possible samples. I'm not dumb. I know that samples are naturally going to be a little bit higher than 7, and some are naturally going to be a little bit lower than 7. But the mean of all samples should be 7 if that really is the truth. And then, boy, I wish I could use standard deviation, but I'm going to have to use standard error. And the standard error is actually why this is a T distribution, even though it looks normal. T distributions do look normal. But um, the standard error is taking the uh, standard deviation of my sample, 1.24, and dividing it by the square root of the sample size, 50. And that's how I got 0.175. So I put 7 smack dab in the middle. I went up, 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 1, 2, 3 standard errors. Down, 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 one, two, three, standard errors as well. Now, I do have to check those conditions, of course. So the only way my sender is truly going to be seven is if the 50 students were selected randomly to avoid bias. Check, check. The sample of 50 has to be assumed less than 10% of all students. It said it was a pretty big school, so I'm pretty confident that 50 is under 10% to assume independence. And the sample of 50 is big enough to use a sampling distribution that follows a T distribution with 49 degrees of freedom. And the reason for that is because 50 is larger than 30. So as long as our sample is at least 30, 30 or larger, then we could always use a sampling distribution. But again, why, do, why can't I use a normal model here? Because I'm using the standard deviation of my sample right here instead of sigma, the standard deviation of all students, which I, again, I don't know that. So again, it does look a lot like normal model. Like I said, T distributions are, they're just pretty, they're just a little flatter and more spread out, but you know, they look for the most part a lot normal. And with 49 degrees of freedom, that's actually gonna be pretty close to normal as well. It's still not exactly normal, but pretty close. Um, so that's why it does look pretty much the same there. So now it comes, you know, my favorite part, is looking for my evidence. Where does our sample fit in? Now, if you remember, our sample mean was 6.23. And before we move on to the next step, you could kind of just look at this picture and realize right away, 
that is pretty low. But now we got to prove that it's low. So to prove that, we need a t-score. So we're going to take the 6.23 minus the standard or minus um, the null, which was seven, and we are going to divide that by the standard error, which was 0.175 and we got a T-score of negative 4.4. Now negative 4.4 is gonna be literally way over here somewhere, very, very low. So I'm already getting a strong feeling that this is gonna be pretty significant. Now the P-value is the probability that any other sample comes back lower than mine. X bar is a sample less than mine, and that is equal to a um, the T-score being less than mine, negative 4.4, and to do that, I'm going to use TCDF on my calculator. I'm actually going to pull that up real quick just so everybody can see once again where I get that from. So second VARS, TCDF is right there, number six. Now remember, we want to look lower than negative 4.4. So I'm going to use negative 99 to negative 4.4. And then don't forget, you do have to put in the degrees of freedom because it needs to know which T model to use. With 50 kids in my sample, that's 49 degrees of freedom. And that is how we get the um, 0 0.0000292. So that is how I got that p-value. Now that is pretty low, guys. What I'm saying is that the probability of a sample of 50 students being 6.23 hours per night of sleep or less is unbelievably low. The probability of this sample happening is low, meaning it shouldn't be happening. But wait, it did happen. So the only conclusion I can make is that the seven I put in the middle is wrong. So that is why, because my p-value is clearly less than 0.01, that was my alpha level that I used of 1%, I will reject it all. There is significant evidence that the mean amount of time that high school students at Maggie's school sleep is less than seven hours. So I even, again, I like to always add a little bit of rich context. Remember the question was talking about students that need to be prepared for high school, needing that seven hours of sleep. So at Maggie's High School, school officials should be very concerned that students are not getting the sleep they need to be prepared to learn. So maybe this is a turning point. Maybe the school could actually have a call for action to move the beginning of school to say 8, 8.30. That way kids could actually get more sleep and be more prepared. But this is the type of reason why we do these examples. We do these problems because this is stuff that's done the real world to actually try to prove things. All right. Let's take a look at something else. I actually wanna continue with this problem for a second here. I wanna actually show you that a confidence interval should agree, okay? Now I know that we learned about confidence intervals um, already in this unit, but I wanna make sure you understand that they should agree. So let's create a 98% confidence interval. Now why am I choosing 98% confident? Because that'll put 1% at the bottom, and that's the 1% that we used in our tests to show significant. Remember, Maggie was only gonna get that good evidence if she could show that her sample was in that bottom 1%. So that's why I'm gonna use a 98% confidence interval because it has 1% at the bottom. So remember, let's, I'm not gonna, you know, we already checked the conditions and all that stuff. I'm just gonna do the confidence interval. So I'm gonna take the 6.23, I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna go down a T star for 98% confident. So let's grab our calculators here. We're gonna go and grab a uh, invert T, 98% confident, puts that 0.01 at the bottom. And again, we have 49 degrees of freedom. So that is, takes a second, 2.4049, 2.4049 times the standard error. Now remember, the standard error is going to be taking the standard deviation of our sample, 1.24, divided by the square root of our sample size of 50. All right, so now we just gotta put all this into our calculator to get that um, margin of error there in the back. So the first thing I'm gonna do is grab my calculator. I'm gonna do the 2.4049, and I'm gonna multiply that by the um, 1.24 standard deviation, divided by the square root of my sample size 50. And that's my margin of error, 0.422. So I have six, uh, let's see here, 6.23, 6.23 divided by, well, I mean, that's divided by plus or minus the 0.422 that I just got. 
So here's that 6.23 plus or minus the margin of error, 0.422. And if I actually go ahead and do this, check out what happens. So I get 6.23 minus 0.422. That's the bottom of my interval, 5.81. And then if I take the 6.23 plus 0.422, I get 6.65. So why does this interval agree with my conclusion from the test? Because seven is not in the interval. Seven is way up here somewhere. Sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Seven's way up here somewhere. So my interval is saying I'm pretty confident that the students at Maggie's school get somewhere between 5.8 and 6.7 hours of sleep per night, showing that they do get less than seven, which is why I rejected seven and said that students in her school are not getting enough sleep. So the whole point here is that, you know, confidence interval should agree with what your test is. All right, let's look at our second example here. This is a one sample t-test as well. Wildlife experts in Pennsylvania have concluded that if the mean number of deer per square mile in the wilderness is found to be more than 25, then actions must be taken to reduce the, peer, the deer population. You know, sometimes when the deer population gets too big, wildlife experts need to reduce that population or it could actually cause harm. So currently experts are trying to determine if there is an overpopulation of deer. So they're trying to determine, do we have more than 25 deer per square mile? Because if there is, there's a problem. All right. So to help make the decision, they randomly select 10 one square mile plots throughout their wilderness in Pennsylvania. The number of deer in each plot is listed below. Uh, does this provide significant evidence that the mean amount of deer is over 25 and action should be taken to reduce the population at the 5% level? Now, in a problem like this, notice that they don't give you the mean. They don't give you the standard deviation of the sample. You actually have to go ahead and find that on your own. So this is where you do need to use your calculator. So we're going to go stat edit and we're going to go and enter this data in. I entered it into list four. You could use any list you want. But in list four, I enter 27, 22 deer, 18 deer, 32 deer, 24 deer, 23 deer, 28, 35, 27, and 26. So those were the deer in each of my 10 one square mile plots. All right, so now to get the mean and standard deviation, I'm just gonna hit stat, so I'd have a calc. One variable stats, make sure you choose the proper list. I use list four, so I'm hitting second number four. Leave the frequency list blank. There's no probabilities attached here. And we're gonna go ahead and hit calculate, and there we go. So we get a mean of 26.2 and a standard deviation of 4.894. That is the S, 4.894. So those are the two numbers we're gonna need. So in the previous problem, I just gave you those numbers. There are gonna be questions like this on the AP test where you actually go ahead and have to get those. So I have a mean of 26.2 and I have a standard deviation of 4.894. Now the question is, yes, 26.2 is more than 25, but is it significantly more than 25 that I can say that overall in the entire state of Pennsylvania, we have an overpopulation of deer? So here I go with my four-step process. Step one is I'm going to conduct a one sample t-test for the mean amount of deer in one square mile plot on the wilderness of Pennsylvania. The null is that it's 25, because 25 is okay. It's more than 25 is when I have a problem. So 25 is okay. Honestly, anything less than 25 is obviously gonna be okay, right? But we always use an equal sign for our null. So we're gonna go and assume that 25 is the okay number. And that is a mu, that is the mean of every single one square mile plot in all of the wilderness of Pennsylvania. And the alternative though, is what we're trying to check. We're trying to check, do we have an overpopulation problem? So we're trying to check is, is that mean of each one square plot more than 25? All right, cause you'll even notice, look at my data. Some plots were like 18, that's well under 25 and some were 35, that's over. And again, that's how we got our mean of 26.2. And that's what we're gonna answer is, is this enough evidence to actually show that there's an overpopulation problem? All right, so second step is to build that standard uh, or that sampling distribution. So the plots have to be random to avoid bias. So the 10 plots were selected randomly. Now, as long as that's true, the mean of all samples, you know, there's, I only looked at 10 samples, but there are probably hundreds of thousands of different samples of size 10. Um, sampling distribution is gonna show me all of them, but I'm gonna put 25 smack dab in the middle because that's what I have to assume to be true. That's the null. But again, that's only allowed as long as we have a random sample. 
Um, it's safe to assume that 10 one square mile plots in Pennsylvania is less than 10% of all one square mile plots. I mean, Pennsylvania is a really big state. And honestly, a one square mile plot is pretty small compared to the entire state. Um, also, here's the other thing here. 10 plots is actually less than 30. So this is one of those examples that does come up on the AP test where you actually have to check your data because I need to make sure that if I'm going to use a T distribution, I need to make sure that my data is roughly, you know, roughly symmetric, right? So meaning no major outliers, no major skewness. So I actually made a little plot right here for you. Okay, but let me just show you real quick how I made that. We already entered the data onto my calculator. So all you have to do is go to second y equals to your stat plots, turn plot one on, select a little histogram, make sure you're using the proper list, and then all is good, and it's zoom nine, that's our zoom stat. And again, do I see any major skewness? No. Do I see any major outliers? No. It doesn't look perfectly normal or symmetric, but it doesn't look terrible either. Remember, I only had 10 plots to begin with. So that is why it is safe to use a sampling distribution that follows a T model with nine degrees of freedom. Um, 10 in my sample minus one, nine degrees of freedom. All right, so now comes my standard error. And this is actually why I have to use a T model, taking the 4.894, the standard deviation of my sample, dividing by square root of 10, get 1.548. So I went up, 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 one, two, three, down, 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 one, two, three, standard errors. All right, now, once again, you could play this game. We already know our sample was 26.2. So you could already kind of look and say, oh, 26.2? That's really not that much higher than 25. But we actually need to prove that, right? So first, we're going to find our T-score. Take the 26.2, our sample mean. Subtract the null, which was 25. Divide by standard error, and we get 0.775. And again, 0.775 is right about there, which is the same place that 26.2 is. 26.2 is just the actual sample mean, the mean amount of deer in my samples, where 0.775 is the T-score that tells me it's 0.775 standard errors above the mean. So we realize right away that this is not unusually high. This is not significant at all. So I need my p-value to back that up. So the p-value is the probability that any sample is more than mine. So I'm going to look at any sample mean being more than my sample mean of 26.2, which is looking greater than a t-score of 0.775. So using TCDF on my calculator, going from 0.775 to infinity, which is going to be a 99, don't forget the nine degrees of freedom, I actually get a very, very high p-value. Now, what this is telling me is that my sample's not significant. My sample mean, or anything more than my sample mean, is actually very, very likely. So the question is, is why? Then why did we see 26.2 when, when we were supposed to see 25? Well, Sampling variability, right? The explanation isn't that there's an overpopulation of deer. The explanation is just that I saw a slightly higher number because it's a sample and that's what samples do. They vary. So no need to be concerned here. Here's my nice conclusion. Since my p-value of 0.2291 is greater than my alpha of 0.05, I will fail to reject the model. It's just not significant. There is no significant evidence that the mean amount of deer in one square mile plot is more than 25. So there is no over, you know, deer population, overpopulation. There is no reason for the wildlife to take any kind of precautions to try to reduce the amount of deer, which usually means open hunting. So essentially the deer are safe and nothing needs to be done about overpopulation because there is no evidence of overpopulation. Yes, our sample was a little higher, but it wasn't significantly higher to tell us that it's more than 25. So the deer can rest easy. All right, guys, um, hopefully those two more examples really help it kind of soak in and make a lot of sense and hope you're ready now to do some problems on your own. Best of luck.